All right, so we're going to get started um, with our next graphic design lecture. Uh, this one is much more about structure and organization of content and how we go about it, grid systems, et cetera. I apologize in advance for the fact that it's really cold in this room. When I walked in this morning, I think it was 54 degrees with the air conditioner on. So go figure, right? Um, we did contact buildings and grounds. They're, quote, aware of the problem. Don't know whether that'll mean anything, but um, I did put my hand up by the vent and it's definitely blowing air conditioned air. So it is what it is. We'll try to survive as best we can, but uh, stay, stay in your jackets and, and stay warm. It, you know, it is what it is. So hopefully they can sort it out soon. So today we're going to talk about structure and organization in graphic design and we'll start with grid systems. And what I talk about today will pertain specifically to your um, poster that you're going to make as part of your assignment uh, 103, but it also will deal really predominantly with your, your portfolio that you're going to be do, doing for the end of the semester and we'll actually take some time and work on your portfolio uh, coming up in the, in the next couple weeks. And so when I talk about this stuff, think about it in terms of your poster but also in ter terms of your final portfolio for the class. So let's start with an anatomy of grids uh, and grid systems and we'll start with the term margins. Uh, margins essentially define the active and inactive area of the page. If you imagine for a second that we were turning in your English paper to your professor and your text went from one edge of the page all the way to the other edge of the page and it started at the very top of the page and went to the very bottom of the page, it would be kind of awkward. There'd be no space around it and your text would just bleed right off the page. So we use something called a margin that directs the person who's reading or viewing or looking at your work to the spot that they're supposed to look at. And those margins can vary a great deal depending on what format you're trying to, to show. If, for example, we had an English paper and it was just a single piece of eight and a half by 11, the margins would typically be even on the two sides. If it was a book where the two pages were facing each other, the margins would be a little different. So it changes depending on what format we're actually presenting this information in. Sometimes we do put some subordinate information, a footer, a page number, Right? Those kinds of things might show up as part of this, and those can go in the margins. But generally speaking, the margins are plain or blank. So if we look here at this example, the margins are highlighted in blue. They essentially go around the content. And we've got even margins on the top and the right and left sides, but on the bottom it's a little bit bigger in this particular example. And so again, it depends on the format and the general graphic design. Then we move into something called columns. And columns are, are probably something you're already very aware of. If you've read a magazine, um, typically content, a newspaper, typically content comes in column format. The idea behind column format is the smaller the column is, the quicker we can read through a particular paragraph. So if you imagine the front page of a newspaper, not that anybody reads newspapers anymore, but if you imagine the front page of a newspaper or a magazine, you can fit more brief bits of content in that area because it's narrow and you can do a quick read and then you, you know, search through the paper for the rest of the article. So it works nicely for lots of varied content, but it also kind of breaks up the words into very manageable smaller paragraphs. If we had a big format and I had one line that went all the way across and I had to actually, let's say it was the chalkboard here and I had the line of text start here, it was in 12 point font, so you had to read it small and it went all the way across the chalkboard, I'd have to move along and read it as I went and it would be really awkward. So by shortening the column down, it's easy to read is the idea. So it can divide the page if we have multiple columns and the widths vary according to the design in general. So what are we trying to, to show here? How many columns occur on a specific page? So I have the columns highlighted here. In this case, it's four columns. Then we move into column, col yeah, column intervals. Sometimes these are called gutter widths. It's essentially the space between the columns. If one column ran into the next column and there was no space between, well, it wouldn't feel like there was much of a column, but it would also be really confusing. If you imagine a paragraph of text in one column with no space between it running into a paragraph of text in the other column, you wouldn't know where to stop your sentence. So the, the space or the gutter intervals uh, or the column intervals are absolutely critical to give us that spacing between them and to make it very uh, easy to read and to prevent the visual elements from colliding. 
There's such a glare on the screen, I'm going to have to change the blue highlight color because you can't really see it very well. Then we get into flow lines. This is in support of a column and a column interval in that it goes horizontally across the page and divides the content horizontally. So we get an upper content and a lower content. This can be a really, really good tool in a portfolio design in terms of how you divide up the page and where you include certain images. So it's a great horizontal alignment point. We see it highlighted there in red and or blue. And that flow line is consistent across pages. I'll show you a bunch of examples down the road. But the flow line also doesn't have to happen only at the top. So the last example that I showed you was at the top. In this case, it's two, uh, two thirds of the way down toward the bottom. So the flow line can exist at multiple places along the page. It's just something that divides and organizes uh, horizontally. Grid modules are spatial areas that support the content of the design. Essentially, if we take the columns and we divide it by flow lines, we can end up with these grid modules, little squares that we can plug content into. Um, and the number that you use can vary from one to the next. So essentially, as this is continuing here, our grid modules, since this is a little easier, are these. Right? And then we continue uh, with what? Uh, five, six, seven, eight. You guys get the idea, right? Each of those little squares is a grid module, and we can combine those modules together to make content as we start to build it up. So the module system is really good at allowing you to place content within a specific um, page. So here's an example of a layout using the grid module. In this case, all of the photos fit within one of those modules. So we have a three by three grid module, but notice that they've chosen to make the text span two modules and two modules. So just because you have this grid doesn't mean it's one image or one piece of text per grid. So we can choose to break it. We could choose to have one photograph. Let's say this one could have been one whole photograph instead of four separate photographs with these smaller ones there and there. So it can work really nicely as a system to help you organize your content. And it's also flexible enough to allow you to place different size content within this page. The good news about something like this, in this sort of a system, is as your content varies, i.e. your portfolio, you're going to have a bunch of different formatted things to put into it. If you have a good system underlying that, it'll be easy to adjust for the various content that you're putting in. And it won't feel awkward when you put those different sizes in place. So working with basic grids. The basic grid is designed to unify and order the compositional space. It gives you the framework. It's kind of like laying a foundation for a building. It gives you the framework to build upon what's happening in the building itself. The underlying structure, i.e. the grid, is not something that has to be overly important or overly obvious. We can break it. We can control it. But it shouldn't be like, I have grid paper underneath my drawing and I can see the grid paper. So it's designed to be something in the background that just guides you. You want to compose your visual elements to provide balance and contrast and or shape the entire page. The other thing is you want to avoid an arbitrary grid. Don't use a grid because you want to use a grid. Use a grid that works with your content. If you use a grid that's too small, for example, with too many little squares or too many little grid modules, it's almost like using no grid at all. You want to think about what is the size of each element, how do they belong, what's the minimum size grid that I need, and don't do too much. It's really important not to over grid. Okay? So it's based on the complexity of this visual data. Functions of grid. These are the kinds of lists. I throw these up there. You could come up with the same list if we worked on it. But it's basically, it's an organizational and control method, provides some rhythm for the overall piece, etc. So if we think about a grid, and we, we, it's easy to think of a grid as lots of little squares, the three by three grid or whatever. But essentially, a grid could be as simple as a single column, one content area on the page. It's perfect for large amounts of continuous text, your English paper, your history paper. Right? Those fit really nicely in a single <coughs> column grid. 
The space is therefore defined by the margins. So what you pick as your margins around the page defines the active area of the page. The margins usually need some adjustments. Usually little, need little tweaks along the way. If, for example, we have facing pages, like a book, shown here, we need the sides and the bottom to be a little bit larger than the top. The inner margin is typically half the outer margin. And the positions are mirrored across the spread. So if we look at this, this is a blown up version of the page. If we are analyzing this, this space up here, from there to there, is larger than the space from here to here. Page numbers occur in that margin space. This width from there to there is double this width from there to there. That's a typical book layout. But again, you would only do that if you had a book where you had facing pages against each other. If you had a single page, chances are you'd shift this whole body of text over so that it would be even on each side, and the top would still be larger than the bottom. That's typical formatting. So it depends on whether you have a single page or you have multiple pages. So in terms of laying out text, if we jump for a second down here at the bottom, that's the end result of this layout system, where we have more space on the top of the page than we do at the bottom of the page. But our content is nicely laid out within the overall framework of the pages. I'm going to show you how to create this today as part of your graphic design, uh, InDesign work, just so you get an experience. We'll work with layers. We'll do non-printing layers. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that goes into this. But essentially, we're going to create this by using our double spread and then doing some special diagonal lines like that. And then through those diagonal lines, we can create where these content boxes occur. And then ultimately, we can, we can break them down. This is a golden section to divide it into two different columns. And then we'll work to create a flow line that goes horizontally. And I'll walk you through how this whole process works. Okay? It's a good, kind of easy way to establish a good grid system that looks nice. And if you look down here at the bottom, right, you can see that we have the full paragraphs on the right side. But on the left side, we have the full paragraphs. And then it's broken into image with little caption. And the proportions just feel pretty good in that generic layout. This number is, is totally important to remember. If you're trying to divide something by a golden section, 0.618 will get you what that ratio is, which can work really nicely. We'll come back to this when I'm working in actual InDesign, and you can see this um, and working. But 0.618 is a good number to remember. Multiple column grids. So we did the single column grid, the one English paper with the one body of text. When we start to break it into multiple column grids, it gives you essentially nearly endless possibilities. As soon as you start to have lots of grid modules, you can do almost anything with. It's, it's suitable co for complex designs. And it can really create movement or rhythm or drama, contrast, those things, because we have a lot of flexibility. Let's look at this poster a little bit larger here. How many columns are in this poster? Four. It's easy to think three because we, we, oops, hold on. We can see this column, this column, and this column easy. But this, come on, draw, is that fourth column. So we have a four column grid. We have a column interval that's happening as we go through it. Right there is our column interval. Those are our spaces between the columns. Okay. There is some extra space over here on the side. I wouldn't consider that a column. I just think it's, it's margin space. It's extra space that helps direct it. Similar, we've got a little extra space there in terms of how it's laid out. But this is fundamentally a four column layout. Notice that we also have a very strong flow line that happens right across there. And that flow line corresponds to the difference between this DAAP and the lecture series text. So it gives us a focal point. When we first look at this poster, we know we're supposed to look right there to start. And then we can digest from here in terms of what's happening. And there's an established hierarchy, which we'll talk about as we go forward. So I'll take, a, I'll take time on each of these when I blow them up and kind of talk through the various options. Obviously, in this lecture, I focused on posters because that's what you're going to be creating first. So it's a good place to go. We'll do a, a lecture on portfolios in a little bit. And you'll see a lot on, 
on kind of how portfolio layout works and that sort of thing. So I'm not ignoring portfolios, but since you're doing a poster first, we'll concentrate on that. Modular grids are extensions of multiple column grids with the additional horizontal flow lines. So we add those flow lines in. It's pretty hard to find a multiple column grid like the one, the last one, without a flow line in it anyway. Okay, so we end up kind of lumping these together into module grids. And the, the idea here is that this, the page is, is um, set up of multiple little grid modules. Okay? Determining the modules. You don't want the modules to be too small for a paragraph. So if you had uh, a module that was really small and you had one word in each module going down the page, it would be awkward. So you want the, the module to be large enough to support the text of a paragraph. Of course, you can span multiple paragraphs or multiple modules with a paragraph if you need it to. But you also want to think about the smallest size that you want of an image. When I did my first portfolio for grad school, um, I will talk about this in the portfolio lecture, but I ended up doing seven complete portfolios before I decided on this was the one that I was going to use. And it takes that, that trial and error to figure it out. The first one I did had a bunch of little squares in it. And on the cover it looked really cool because I had these little modules and the little, little vignettes of what all my designs were and it kind of looked good. But when I got into the content of the page, the, the grid module, the little tiny grids, were just too small to show anything. I couldn't show any good detail. I needed bigger pieces. And so you want to think about what is the smallest size of a photograph that you really want to show. They need to be big enough to see. You, of course, for, for a photo or for uh, text, you could break the grid module. You could span two or span three. But if you're starting to span it too much, I'm always spanning two or three grid modules, chances are your grid modules are too small. So you want them big enough. Bunch of layouts. And this is, again, based on the same kind of uh, setup here, where we have the large square, we have the portrait, the landscape, and the mixed. These are just sample how we would break down, let's see, in the square column, for example. We're using one large image, two smaller images, lots of smaller images, and kind of how those work together as a, as a, as a theme. This is good for reference as you think through. So as we continue. The more modular grids that we use, the, the more compositional flexibility we have. Obviously, we, if we can plug in information into different modules, it makes it a little bit easier to, to create varied composition. They must be flexible to accommodate changing content. And you'll discover this in depth when we get into your portfolio. For the first uh, assignment you did, your best photograph. Okay, the second one, you did some kind of a collage work. The third one, you're creating an 11 by 17 poster. Then we're going to create a 24 by 36 AutoCAD drawing. Right? So there's lots of different sizes that are suddenly going to have to fit into one portfolio. And so how do we make all those different sizes of content work in a portfolio context? And that's one of the big challenges. Alternative grids definitely work there. They tend to be the loose and the organic. They tend to involve a lot more on your intuition and kind of your 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 like if you're placing elements, you have, to, you have to think about, does that really work? Does it feel right? Does it not feel right? So it's a little bit harder. They can be very, very good. I've seen a few portfolios and a few posters use this strategy. They can end up awesome. But at the same time, they can fail miserably because they don't have the right hierarchy or they don't have the right layout and it's hard to read them. So it works and it doesn't work. This tends to be for the more advanced people to try. Okay? They often evolve from a basic grid we take the grids apart, we shift the grids, those kinds of things. I would stick somewhere in the middle, personally, where I'd start with a grid and I'd intentionally break it in a few key moments, as opposed to creating something entirely from scratch. So something like this, as a poster, is part of this kind of alternative grid layout. There's a little bit of grid structure, but it's not really like this is not a three column poster, by any means. It's also not really a grid module poster. You can see a little bit of grid structure to it, but it's just not quite there. So it relies heavily on intuition in terms of the placement of elements. So the visual elements define the page. The compositional structure is based on a visual element or focal point. So in this particular case, let me go forward and make this big. If we were to look at this, we have this yellowish. Come on, start drawing. Really? 
There we go. We have this yellowish piece that defines a lot of what's happening on the page. It directs us to that point, and that happens to be where a bunch of these words are broken and kind of gets us into the, the page itself, but it's not a traditional column. It's kind of this diagonal and how these are they're put together. This text is going that way. This is going this way. There's no flow line. You can kind of see how this has evolved as an organic layout. It's different. But at the same time, it works pretty well. It grabs your attention. So it can be an effective design strategy. Here's another example here of a page portfolio layout. This definitely doesn't fit within a grid context. But if we look at page to page, there are certain elements that are consistent. So if we look here at the strong diagonal that's happening on this page, the same strong diagonal is happening on that page. This is that, page to page. So we see a consistency in the pages, and the grid exists, but it's not a traditional grid. Does that kind of make sense? So there's still an established framework. It's not completely arbitrary. I just threw my stuff on the page. There's still some concise, carefully considered thought for how these pieces come together and how they make the overall composition. Grids are always a base, but don't be afraid to break the grid. It's kind of like an architectural design where we have a field of columns. And you guys will experience this when you do your Mondrian Museum. Uh, you guys are doing that right now, right? Mondrian, isn't it about the right time for that? You finished it? Calder. Okay, so then you're going to move into the Montreal Museum. So it's coming. It's coming up for you. The idea here is that you have a grid of columns that are supporting. They're structural elements they're supporting. And one of the, the amazing things that we as architects can do is we can create a focal point. We can create a good space by simply moving one thing out of place. Remember when I was talking about the compositional techniques and I had the symmetry where we had the symmetrical Brooklyn Bridge and all the people were on the right instead of on the left? Those moments where we break something can be a really powerful moment in design. So when we're talking about a grid module system, when we choose to break something, when we choose to move something slightly off center, we choose to span multiple grid modules, those are the moments that become exciting. Those are the moments that naturally get, grab your attention. So breaking it is, is a really good move, but you have to do it selectively and very carefully. If you do it all the time, it defeats the purpose. It's one moment we change something, that becomes the focal point. So you use a grid as a guide, not a dictator. So it's there to help you, but it's not there to rule you. And that's an important distinction. So let's talk about the interaction of visual elements and how they work together. So one of the key components to good, solid graphic design is establishing some kind of a hierarchical hierarchy of development of elements. And so what we need is a clear focal point that attracts the eye. So if I pull up here this poster, this lecture series, for example, I need something on this that grabs your eye first, and then I need sub subsequent elements that continue to get you more interested. So if we look here, architecture probably stands out. Then Diablo Valley College and lecture series are the next size down. So there's this clear hierarchy of elements. We then meld subordinate visual elements that allow for an in-depth view of the topic. That just means that we take smaller and smaller elements and we put them in so that as you get closer, as you read more, you get more information. You're leading the viewer through a logical and meaningful journey. So you start with the most important thing and you work your way down. If a hierarchy is not established, you tend to, when you see something, you get distracted and you don't spend time looking at it. So if there's too much going on, your eye just says, oh, forget it, and it moves on to something else that's more interesting. So we want this clear chain of events to work with. So let's look at this poster, for example. So if you kind of look at this really quickly, what's the thing that jumps out at you? Probably National Portfolio Day. Okay, so that's the primary element. It's the largest text. And it's easy to think of hierarchy in terms of text, because it's easy to see that. Sometimes it's actual visual elements. But if we look at this, National Portfolio Day right there is number one. That grabs your attention. Followed by 
probably the date and or who's hosting it. Those are the, the next two sub-elements. Then we get into a little bit more detail. There's a little description here that provides a little bit more detail. Then we get down here into a little bit of additional supplemental detail. And then we get into a little, little, little bitty stuff at the bottom. So we've established this hierarchy so we know when we look at this poster what's item one right here versus item two, three, four, and five. So it's a clear progression of how we work our way through this particular poster. I like this rule, and I, th I think this is something that, that if you can remember it, will work really well for a graphic design piece like a poster, but it'll work equally well for a final presentation for architecture. You're hanging your poster on the wall, you're doing your drawings for your Mondrian or your Calder Museum. If you think of this when you're doing that, you'll get far better results. 12, 6, 3, 1. So you want to think at multiple scales when you're creating this piece so that you have different things that are seen at different distances away. So if you think about 12 feet, right, it would be about from, let's call it here to the wall. Okay? I have something hanging on the wall. I want to look at it. What do I see from that distance? Well, in this case, I have an equal opportunity poster on the wall. It's not very exciting. Nobody spent any time graphically worrying about that. And I don't really see anything other than the big black square. But as I move forward, half the distance, I get to six feet, I can start to see a little bit more. I see the headline. As I get to three feet, I see a little bit more. I see the bold text. And as I get to one foot, I see that much more detail. So if you think about a poster in that context, you will always have more information that you're showing as you get closer and closer. And if you're inviting somebody to view something, if you want them to get interested in it, providing new information at each level as they get closer causes them to keep getting closer and want to view your particular design. So you want to think through this. What do you see at multiple scales? So let's look at this one. Primary element jumps out at you, probably National Portfolio Day in black and white. Then we get the sub-elements, the yellow with the black text. Then we get into smaller and smaller elements. If we imagined this poster using the same rule, I would have to stand a little bit further back because obviously I blew the poster up way larger than it was intended to be. But let's say that I stand right back here and I'm walking forward. As I look at this, I see National Portfolio Day. It really stands out. But then I, I, I need to move half the distance. So in this case, it's just obviously further than 12 feet, but the poster's giant, right? So I move half the distance, and as I get closer, I start to see a little bit more detail. Maybe I can read at half the distance. Maybe I can start to read what's happening there instead of just this information at the top. So let me move a little bit closer. Half the distance closer. Maybe I can start to read this information, the headlines here and here. And as I get all the way up to really close, obviously if it wasn't a projection, I could start to see all of the detail in these areas. So I've established this hierarchy such that as I move forward and closer, I get more and more interesting information to see. So getting started. The easiest way to do this is to quickly rank elements by importance. So if we're doing a poster for a lecture series, what's the most important thing? It's a lecture series, OK? Then what would be the next most important thing? Maybe where it is, when it is, something like that. Maybe who's speaking. You have to define what this hierarchy is. And it can be as simple as a little bullet point list with numbers. And once we have those numbers, it's pretty easy to start to rank the visual importance and make sure that that matches up with your number system. High ranking visual elements occur in the foreground. Less important elements go toward the background. Subordinate elements will occupy the middle ground and also the background. Compositional factors, you could come up with this list. We don't have to spend too much time on it, though I do want to point out that one of the things on this list is right here. We spent a whole lecture talking about this last class. It's still important. Don't forget it. Space is also something that's absolutely critical. And that is that space provides visual contrast. We have an active element. We need space around it for that element to come alive. 
If it's crammed up next to everything else, we won't have that. So an effective ordering system needs the space around it to show the ordering system, right? That's, it's an absolutely critical thing to have. You want to focus on the negative space as well as the positive space. Has anybody talked to you about negative and positive space? Okay, a little bit. I see enough nods to where I feel comfortable that you guys understand what I'm talking about. That's good. That's good. Somebody else is doing their job. Space is absolutely imperative for you to get interested in a particular piece and to be able to read what's happening. It directs the eye toward the positive or the visual areas. So this, I don't think I blew this up any bigger. No, I didn't. Okay, so let's look at this piece, for example. This is a little bit difficult to read, but if this space right here didn't exist on this cover, it would get really hard to understand what's happening. It is the space, it is the fact that there's nothing there that causes this whole thing to be readable. And so we focus not on the elements themselves, we start right here at that empty space. I would argue that that empty space is actually ranked number one in the hierarchy of visual elements. So that's first. That's what we look at first. Then we move on. Naturally, we tend to read down. So we go from this to the next word, which is master. Then we get a half of a word here. So even there, though it's the same size and font, we're only getting half of it. That causes us to say, wait a minute, what happened to the other half? Oh, wait, it's up here. Oh, and look at all those, those little statue pieces, all those little photographs. So there's an order through these visual elements that we actually are, are viewing this particular page. And it's starting not with the active content, but with the space, the space around the active content. <coughs> Using space, we group elements together to provide a focal point, whether it's the empty space or the positive space, we're using those elements. If we center an object and equalize the space around it, it doesn't activate the space. It makes the space almost invisible. The alternative is if we off-center, there's a reason when we talked about composition, I use the rule of thirds so much. Put an element on one-third, two-thirds, suddenly the space around the element becomes active and we actually look at it. When you take a photograph of somebody on top of a mountain, you don't take a picture of them in the center with the mountain around because you won't pay attention to the mountain around. You put them on a one-third, you suddenly see all the context. That's what we talk about activating space for. So if we place it off-center, it, it creates a weighted asymmetrical composition. And you also can't have too much space. If we imagine for a second that I'm creating a composition, I have a page up here, and I put an element, right? Oops. Right there. This is my page out here. There's way too much space around it. Okay, so I need a bigger element. Okay, so there's my bigger element, but the space around it is all perfectly even. That doesn't work either. If instead I put my correctly sized element right here and I have space around it, this space is all active. All right, even this space in here is a little active as well. It changes the composition quite a, uh, quite a bit. So it's about appropriate size of element and also space around the element. Scale can be used to establish this hierarchy. Just changing the font size can make a difference. Big font, headline. Smaller font, subheading. Smaller font, content. And we work our way down. Big photo, smaller photo, smallest photo. Same hierarchy. So we use those to establish the hierarchy. We also want to be consistent. So if we, if we say that our, our ratio is you know, full size, two thirds of full size, one third of full size, that should be consistent across all the elements. We don't want to just arbitrarily pick it. Right? One of the big mistakes people make in portfolios and or uh, posters, it, it happens mostly in portfolios, and it's one of the things that I'm going to hit you over the head with as we go forward. And that is that you're working on one page, you set a font size because it looks right, let's say at 10 point, and we have a heading of you know, 14 point, and it's in a particular font. Then we go to the next page, and your font size is totally different. The heading is 16 point, 
and the font size itself is 12 point. And you say, well, wait a minute, I, it didn't work in my pair. Of, well, you change the ratios and it suddenly doesn't look right anymore. So you have to be consistent page to page once you establish that framework. This is another thing that every designer struggles with, and that is quantity of elements. And there's two different ways to go about this, and you will learn very quickly which way is you as a designer. And that is, if we have too many visual elements, we get clutter and it doesn't work. We have too many ideas in our architectural project, there's clutter, there's not clarity, it's too much. So what do we do? We can use additive or subtractive method. The additive method says, I have a blank page, I put one thing on the page. How does it look? Maybe it needs a second thing. We add the second thing. How does it look? Yep, yeah, that's done. I'm done. I don't need to add anymore. The subtractive is, oh man, I have all this content. Let's put it all on the page. All on the page. Oh, that's way too much. Let me take one away. Oh, that's a little better. I take another one away. Oh, that's a lot better. I take one more away. No, that wasn't quite. Put it back. Okay, that's perfect. So you have to think about which way you work. I'm a subtractive person. I put it all on the page and then I pull it off. You may be an additive person, but it's a mental state and you have to learn as a designer which you are, which one works for you. The other thing that's important as a designer, this is a completely sidebar thing, is when you have, let's say I have 10 ideas and my page only supports one idea, those nine ideas go in your back pocket because you'll use them again later. So don't be afraid of cutting them out because they'll end up being used at some point. So it's just the nature of design. <coughs> Orientation and position of elements. This is a great way to lead to a focal point or a strong contrast that enhances the hierarchy. So for example, all, all of our elements are horizontal and suddenly we introduce a vertical element. It's kind of like we have all the columns and we introduce a flow line. When that happens, we create a starting point to view. You can obviously do this with diagonals as well. Do I have this as a larger one? Yeah. So I love this. This is great. This is the I am a dreamer. So we have all of the text that's working horizontally. And then suddenly, in the photograph background, we have our arm. And that divides the page vertically. So we have a strong vertical element that splits all of the horizontal and it happens to be where the I am a true dreamer is divided right there at that point. And that then becomes the primary point that we start this whole composition from. And it works because of the, the strong vertical against the horizontal. And so we want to think about those kinds of elements when we're creating a poster or some kind of a strong visual element that grabs your attention. We can do something similar using depth and perspective. So for example, in this grassy field, we have one poster that's in front. We have other posters that are behind. We can use the, the concept of perspective to do this. This was very popular and or trendy until about 2012, where we were setting things up. It kind of followed suit, and you, you guys may or not, may not have noticed this, and I'll talk about this later on uh, in lecture in more detail, but there, there came a moment where a lot of user interface design switched to flat. Colors, basic shapes, and that sort of thing. We went away from shiny and 3D into this flat realm, and because of the trend, this has gone kind of by the wayside, but it doesn't mean it's not a valid strategy. So using this as a setup, can work very, very nicely. Typography. Remember, I spent a whole lecture talking about this. It's probably important. Don't forget to pay careful attention to the typography. This is as important as any visual photograph element on the page. How you deal with text is critical. And you'll see when you're doing your lecture series poster, that there's an awful lot of text that has to go on a particular page. And so how you carefully craft that text becomes really important. Think macro and micro scales. Remember macro is how the text fits into the overall page. Micro is the little details, the spacing between two letters, those kinds of things. Color is also something that we use a lot in design. 
And I think one of the things about color is that people have a tendency to use too much, too many colors. We think of color and we think of full color, beautiful renderings. Sometimes the most powerful way of using color is to use it very selectively and to pick a particular highlighting color and have that as a theme throughout your whole drawings. If we imagine for a second uh, a, a series of architectural posters that go on the back wall, you're doing your 220 final review, you have different options. We do all this color, beautiful renderings and whatever, and our, and our boards are all color. We have to make sure that we establish a good hierarchy against that color so we can see what's important and what's not important. The alternative to that would be to do everything in black and white and to have one highlight color, say red, and have red elements occur throughout your drawings, and those become the focal points. If everything's black and white and we have one color to look at, it's really easy to see what that clear focal point is. So in your lecture series poster, maybe everything's in black and white except the critical element, and that's in a particular color. We'll spend a whole lecture talking about color and color theory and why you would choose one color over another, but that's for another day. So you want to think carefully about color and how you choose to add it and how many you choose to add. Graphic shapes and linear elements are also something that people have a tendency to put into their designs. They can be great as a support for content. So the, the graphic element that we're talking about here is, for example, that little plus sign below the text. That's what I'm talking about. It's a plus. It's a little line. It's, it's something that controls what we're trying to look at. It guides us through the page. The problem here is that you guys will have a tendency, especially in your portfolios, to establish a portfolio where, let me erase this for a second, to establish a portfolio page. Here's my portfolio page. There it is. And, oh, I need to, let me put a little line there, and, and maybe I'll put a line up here. Let me add another line, maybe two lines, maybe another one that goes over here. And then we'll put the page number there. And put another line, another line. And before you know it, you have so many lines on the page that it completely distracts from the overall composition. So it can be very useful to have a graphic element, but in the context of a portfolio page, for example, maybe you limit it to just one simple line at the bottom. You know, maybe it's one horizontal line along the side. Maybe it's a slight color bar that comes down from one side. It's trying to be clear. This is like that additive and subtractive. Too much is too much. So make sure you don't do too much. And that's critical. So it can be very, very useful to have those subordinate elements. The you as the designer absolutely must create some kind of a hierarchy. You need that organization to communicate your ideas. And it works the same in architectural design as it does in graphic design. You need to order and control the design. You're in charge. You have to, to tell people how to look at this particular poster or how to view your portfolio. You can use contrast to establish the focal area. Horizontal against, or excuse me, all the horizontal against a vertical. Big text versus small text. Those are key moments. And you want to use the compositional factors that we talked about already in the Photoshop section to help you in this process. So the rule of thirds becomes valuable. Right? Those things are still important to think about. Let me show you some, a few more examples and I'll do this just as a booklet, as a portfolio. This is not the portfolio lecture yet. We'll talk about portfolios in depth, and I'll show lots of portfolios. But as we talk about these, this is a particularly nice book because it uses a lot of the elements that I've just talked about. So in here, we have columns. We have a photograph that spans the column. We have a strong focal, uh, flow line that goes across. And that will be consistent as we move from pages. So you see right here, there's our flow line right there, and here's our columns. As we go to the next page, the flow line still exists right there in that yellow box. Then we break it by putting the image all the way at the top and letting it bleed off the page. The columns, three of the columns, got combined together to provide this text. Then we move to the next page. Oops. Right? The flow line jumped down just a little bit. Oops. 
but it's still strong across the page. The four columns still show up in those little bits of text. So you see how this as a booklet is using the vocabulary of the grid to really change every page. Every page is different. It looks different, but it feels like one body of work because of the underlying structure. Another example there. So you can see how this feels like the same booklet. OK, so we're going to move over to InDesign and talk through it. Let's um, regroup at 9.10, 9.12, so that it's a full 10 minutes. And then we'll talk about InDesign, and you guys will get started on your exercise 111. <laughs> OK, so we're going get, to get started again. Uh, and I'm going to walk through some of the layout stuff in InDesign, talk through some of the more complicated things. What you're working on for exercise 111 is a small version, i.e. small version, of your lecture series poster. So it's, it's the precursor, it's the practice round to get some feedback on your lecture series poster um, in advance of, of actually doing it. So I went ahead and I opened up InDesign here. I'm going to create a new document. And when I create the new document, I, I could work in a letter, but since it's a postcard, we'll probably go a little smaller. So I'm going to do 5 by 7. So let me do a width of 5 and a height of 7. Oops, sorry. I have to type 5 in and 7 in. And I'm going to choose facing pages because I want this, I want to illustrate uh, that layout strategy, the grid system layout that I was doing a little bit earlier. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it at facing pages for right now. I'm going to take my margins and put them at 0 because I don't want to think that I have some kind of arbitrary margins to work with. And the rest of the options will be just fine. I'll go ahead and click OK to get started. And so I have my single page that will, that will work as my start of my architecture postcard here. And I'm going to go ahead and right click up here where the rulers cross and change my um, units to inches just so that those are clear. And there is my 5 by 7. Sounds pretty good. Next thing I'm going to do is in the upper right corner, I'm going to click on the Pages window. I'm still in typography from last class. That's fine for right now. We can leave it in typography. And I'm going to go ahead and create a couple new pages. So right now I have just page one. I'm going to click on the new page icon, which is right down here at the bottom. And I'll create two new pages. So I have pages two and page three. And the reason that I wanted page two and three is because I'm going to use this as part of my, my layout strategy. Um, so I have two pages that are next to one another now. And you can see that I go from zero to 10 as my pages. So I have five inches on one and five inches on the other. I'm still only going to work on the right side. But um, I'll use this as part of my overall layout. So just as with Photoshop, InDesign has layers. And if I click on the layers, window right here, which is right below pages. I have something called layer one. And the only difference between Photoshop layers and InDesign layers is we can have multiple objects on a single layer. So thus far, when you've been working in InDesign, like for example, when you did your type, your word art last class, you created everything on the same layer in all likelihood. You didn't create any new layers. And by working all on the same layer, you can just arrange your objects within that layer. We can, however, create multiple layers to help organize our work. And so I'm going to go ahead and come down again to the bottom of the Layers window and click the New icon. And you'll see that I have now Layer 1 and Layer 2. For clarity purposes, I'm going to rename Layer 1 to be Guides. And we'll leave the color of the layer as light blue. And you'll see right down here under the Layer option, there's a checkbox for Print Layer. If I uncheck print layer, this, the stuff that I draw on this page won't show up when I go to print. So this is guides. I don't want anything to show up. I'm going to make it a non-printing layer. So I'll go ahead and say OK. So it's called guides. You can tell that it's a non-printing layer because it's italicized up here in the layers window. OK, so with the guides layer active, so I'm going to click on the blue guides layer. I'm going to use the line tool right here. 
And I'm going to draw a line from this corner of my screen to that corner of my page, so all the way across. And I'll do the same thing going from this corner down to that corner right there. And you'll notice that naturally InDesign kind of snaps to the corners, which, which allows us to be fairly accurate. So now that I have that X, I'm also going to draw one additional line, and that is from this point there to that point right there. And I'll also draw one line from here down to that point as well. And I should pull up just so you guys can see this. This, by the way, is if we went to today's lecture, you can click the PDF and you can see exactly what I'm doing for guides here. Let's see here. Here's our printable. Yeah. So, oh, come on. It's like a three megabyte file. It shouldn't, this should not be that hard. No, I'm just trying to see it. Really? Come on. Let's see if this one works. Well, anyway, sorry. You're supposed to be able to click on this and see it. That would be nice. Let me say, let me see if I can save the link as a See, 3.6 megabytes. This should not be hard. Anyway, we'll let that download. I'll bring it back in a second. The, I, the idea behind that is I was going to pull up the, the drawing so you guys can see it as a reference point. OK, so what, I, what I've done by creating these little divisions is I've started to create some guides for myself. And I can actually draw vertical guides by pulling from the rulers over. So let's identify where that point would occur. Right there, for example. And let's identify where that cross is. Now notice that when I pull a guide down, it will either be on the page itself, so in this case it's on the page, or if I drag the guide from outside of my page, it will create a line that goes off in infinity in both directions. So this is contained within the page. You see the difference? That goes out in both directions. So we'll go ahead and let that go out in both directions. And now I've identified where that corner is. Okay, So now I need a little bit more. I'm going to work through and, and create the actual box. Okay, So I could, I could do this in reverse if I wanted to. And I could draw the, the line from here to help figure out where the bottom of the box would be. That would be a symmetrical composition for where that's going to intersect. For me, I think I'm just going to work on it from here. And we'll go ahead and drop this down. And it's probably going to be somewhere down in this vicinity. I'm going to do it by eye, about like that. What I'm essentially doing is creating this content window right there with some nice space around it. Let's see if my thing has downloaded correctly. There we go. All right, so right there. OK. Let me, let me start up a little bit higher. You can see there's my little divisions there. Let me start a little bit higher with this. I'm going to edit this line and pull this up a little bit higher. We'll come back to that point in a, as a second. And we'll start with my content going from here across to there. And let me move this one down a little bit. I was actually very close. There. And essentially what I've created, let me just make this so you can see it, is an area of my screen that will contain content with nice margins around it. Notice 
this is half that width, and the top and the bottom are consistent. So I was able to create this with half and half. Now, if I want to divide this up by that golden ratio, I need to know how long it is from right here to right here. And so as I draw that line, we can see that it's 3.04 inches, very close to 3 inches. And if I did the math, so let's pull up the calculator. If I did 3.04 times 0.618, was that magic number, I get 1.8787. So let's do a line from here that goes over 1.87. Oh, come on. Well, we'll stick. It's either going to be 1.8. We'll go with 1.89. It'll be close enough. And I'm going to divide that right there as well. Let me go ahead and divide this and get rid of that. OK, so now I have this. I have that divided so that I have two different columns. They're different sizes, which can work nicely. Let me pull this line down again to right there. And then I'm going to split the difference between those two lines. Right about there. And remember, everything that I've done has been on the guides layer so far. So when I go to print it, it's all going to go away, which is, which is important. OK, so now I have a flow line that runs across that I'm going to use. And I'm going to start to create some actual content. So let's use the text box here. And I'm going to work in this upper area. And we'll call this lecture series. And I'm going to make this font a little bit bigger. Too big. Still too big. And something like that. And let me change the font. Use something like Arial. Something along those lines. All right. So now I can work with this as a visual element. We'll drop that down a little bit. That. Now, when I created this, I forgot to change my layer. So it's still on the guides layer. And I can tell that because the box that surrounds the text is light blue, which matches the color of light blue on my guides layer. If I want to move it onto my layer 2, I'm going to drag this little box in the layers window up to layer 2. And you see that the box around the text becomes red. It's now on layer 2. With that done, let's leave layer 2 as my active layer so that the things that I draw will continue to be on that layer. And let's go ahead and, and build some additional content. So down below here, right, maybe, actually, you know what? Let's do, let me get some content to put in here. Let me do an image search and Let's look up uh... OK, so this, these, uh, this is Takaharu and Yui Tezuka. Um, they're two architects from Japan that do really, really cool work. They're, they're one of my favorite um, architects out there. I want to use them as uh, the, the example of, of who, somebody who's coming to speak. I need a, a photograph of one of their projects. So let's go ahead and use that one. Let me view the image, and I'll save this image as. And let's remember to put it in our flash drive. I'll put it under today's folder. Oops, wrong thing. Let me do a new folder. And uh, I'll show you some examples of their, their architecture a little bit later on. Let me go ahead and save that. Perfect. And I'll come back here. And what I want is I want a frame that works in this area over here. So we'll create a little frame. I'm going to use a square like that. I held down Shift to create the square. Then I'm going to place the image into this. So I'll go to File and then Place. And I'll take the image there. Remember, right click, go to fitting, fill frame proportionally. Here we go. We see their little 
piece. And then I'll create another text box. We'll go here. And I'm going to use the right justify so that the text starts here. And we'll go and I want my fonts to be consistent. So we'll go back to Arial. Takaharo and Yui Tezuka. And then I'll create another text box below. Something like that. Again, write justified. We'll go to Arial. And instead of 12 point, we'll go to like 9 point. And I need, because I'm not going to spend time and actually uh, write anything, I need uh, Latin filler text. This just gives you some filler text that I can use. Um, there we go. I just needed some, some filler text that looks like English that isn't. So let me come back here. And we'll paste some of that in. That still feels a little bit large. So let's select it. Let's go down to maybe 8 point. Something along those lines. Once I start to establish this and I get this, this worked out, if I were to go to the view menu and I go to screen mode and I go to preview, you'll see that the underlying structure goes away and you can start to see how I've built this up. So maybe I want that lecture series to break. Maybe this needs to be a little smaller. I mean, I have to work through what the, what the pieces are. So let's try this at six point. That's pretty good. Let's make this a little bit taller, something like that. And you can see that I'm starting to work that together. Maybe this needs to be down a little bit more. Maybe it needs a little graphic element like that. And that stroke width maybe needs to be a little bit narrower. Let's go 0.25, so it's a thinner line. And you can start to see I'm building out the content. Okay. Now, the flow line here, remember I can go back to view, screen mode, normal, and I can get back to my, my content here. Maybe this needs to go down a little bit more. Maybe this needs to be a little bit bigger. Let's go 48. Let's pull this off the page. Make that a little bit taller. Too big. That might need to come down. This might need to go up. Oops. I moved my lines too. Um, in order not to move the lines, I'm going to go ahead and go to my layers and I'm going to lock the guides layer so that I don't accidentally move those anymore. Now let me take this and we'll, we'll push that up a little bit so it's a little tighter. And then let me copy it, Control-C, Control-V. And we can start to see how this would lay out. Oops. With multiple um, different lectures happening. Now, I could, I could replace, for example, these with different images, different lecture. You know, let's put this one in. And go to fitting, fill frame proportionally, and then we can change this one. Fitting, fill frame proportionally. And you can start to see that I'm building this, this up. If I were to go to um, view again, screen mode, and then go to preview, again, all my lines go away, and we can start to see what I've been creating. Does that make sense so far? So now let's get into some of the more complicated things that you may want to do. So thus far, I have two columns, and I have this spanning the one column.
But maybe I want an image to span across two, two columns. Right? So let's take, let me go back to view, screen mode. Let's go back to the normal mode. Let's get rid of these components like that. Remember that I can adjust the image to go over here. Again, the image doesn't fill the whole piece, but the frame is bigger. I can right click and go to fitting, and I can fill frame proportionally, and I can see the whole piece. So you can see I'm starting to evolve the design a bit in terms of how they're spanning frames. Now maybe, instead of having one picture that spanned all the way across, maybe I want two pictures. Let me delete this this, and this. Maybe I want another frame that goes here. Make those a little bit closer. Something like that. Notice that that lines up, the margin lines up. And I want this image to span across this frame and this frame. What I can do, and actually let me replace this with a generic frame so you can see this as it happens. OK, so right now I have two separate frames. I have this frame and I have this frame. I want the image to span across both of these. So there's a break between them, but I want it to span across both of these. I can go ahead and I can take this. I can hold down Shift and I can take this frame. They're both selected. And I can go up to the Edit menu or excuse me, the object menu, I can go to paths, and I can say make compound path. So it's once again, it's object, paths, make compound path. And you see that the X now goes across both images. When I go to file and then place, and I drop an image in, the image spans across both frames. Let me go to fitting, fill frame proportionally, and if I were to go to View, Screen Mode, Preview, you can see that I have two frames, and the image goes across both frames. So I could do this with multiple images. So let's take this and come over here. For consistency's sake, let me copy this exactly. You go to view. Sorry, hold on a second. Normal. There we go. All right. So I have lots of frames here. Remember, I can take all of these and I can go to layout, or excuse me, object. Paths, make compound path. It becomes one. Then I could go to file and then place. And I could drop all of the image across these. So let me go to fitting, fill frame proportionally. And then we'll see it, view, screen mode, preview. And you can see that my image goes across all of those. So I have the ability to do that should I want to do it. The other thing that happens is sometimes people want different shapes. So you see, by default, we've been using the rectangle frame. I could create an ellipse frame or a polygon frame, should I want to. So for example, let me go back to screen mode. I'm going to go to normal. And I'm going to create a couple new pages, because these pages are starting to get crowded. So let's come down to a fresh set of pages as I work. And this time, I'm going to create an ellipse. So let's use an ellipse frame tool. The ellipse, if I hold down Shift, becomes a circle, for example. And then I can place an object into that circle. So I can go to File and then Place, Fitting, Fill Frame Proportionally. And you can see that I can drop the image into a circle if I wanted to. I can also create any custom shape that I want using the Pen Tool. We'll talk about the Pen Tool in depth in the world of uh, Illustrator, and then you'll be able to do more with it. But essentially, the pen tool, I could create a custom shape. Let's say it's that. And I'm just clicking to make my shape. When I'm done, it doesn't have the frame X in it, but that's OK. 
it's still a shape. I can go to File and then Place, and I can drop the image into that frame. Let me right click Fitting, Fill Frame Proportionally, and I can make essentially any frame that I want. So as I start to, to, to deconstruct my grid, for example, I may end up creating some arbitrary shapes and then working with those arbitrary shapes as well. So there's a lot of flexibility in, in terms of what we can do with our frames. I can, of course, create multiple frames. Let me go a couple more here. So let's say I have that. Oops. There we go. I could take these two pieces, go to object paths, make compound path, and then I can go to file and then place, and I can drop an image across both of them. Should that be, that be the goal? Right? So you can see how I'm kind of evolving this. The other thing that sometimes people like to do is they like to put text down. So uh, let me see here. Hold on a second. I have, sorry, I have to switch back into non-preview mode. So there's DVC. Let's make it Arial. And let's make this, uh, uh, let's make it bigger. OK, so I have DVC there. I can convert this text into a shape. And I'll do that by going to Type and then Create Outlines. It makes a shape out of it that I can then go to File, Place, and I can drop an image into. So let me go to fill frame proportionally, and there you go. You can you can see that the image can span it. So essentially, anything that I can come up with, any shape that I can come up with, I can choose to place an image inside. And so you've got a lot of flexibility in terms of, of actually creating content. Um, the other thing that becomes important, and that is alignment of issues. So let's say, for example, I start with a rectangular frame, and I want that rectangular frame to be 2 by 2. So I'm going to hold down Shift, and I can move, and I get to 2 by 2. The other option would be to just single click, and you get a dialog box that lets you place a 2 by 2 object. So there it is. Let me create a couple more. Control C, Control V, copies it, and I get another one. And let's do one more below it. So I want to kind of create a grid of these pieces. If I know where the first element occurs, so let's say this one, I can use something called the Align Tools, which if I go to Window, and then I go to Object and Layout, Align, it will pop up the little Align Tool. And what this allows me to do is to select two objects. So I'm holding down Shift and selecting both of these objects. And I can then use the Align Objects to align them to be the same at the top. Now, one of the things that, that becomes important is sometimes you want one object to stay in, the, in its place and the other object to move. If I were to do it right now, they would average. right? One would move up and the other wouldn't. If I want to control which object stays put, let's say I want this object to stay put, I make an additional click and it highlights. And once it's highlighted, then when I say align, the other object will move. So I can pick which one stays in position. Furthermore, I can also control the spacing between objects. So I can say down here, under use spacing, why is it not letting me use spacing? Oh, I have to type in a value. Let's say I want a quarter of an inch between them. I can use the spacing to distribute those objects so that there's a quarter of an inch between them. Let's see if I can do an eighth. There we go. And you can see that there's exactly an eighth of an inch. So let's take this a step further. I want this, this, and this to all be lined up on this edge. This is my key object. 
So I'll highlight it. Let's make them all at an eighth, or all even on the left, and let's distribute them so that there's an eighth between them. Let's go ahead and take these two with that as the key object. Oops. And let's align them to the top. Distribute the spacing for an eighth. I need one more object. You will find in InDesign that there are also little green guides that will show up that will help you align your objects. Sometimes that's an easier strategy. But I wanted to point out the align tools. Now that I have these in position, I can go ahead and I could take, like, say, these two plus this one, and we can go to Object, Paths, Make Compound Path, and then I could place an object into those three fitting fill frame proportionally. You can see that. The alternative would be to create an actual full-size object that spans all of these. I'll go ahead and do that with my pen tool. We'll go from there to there to there. There. And I'll go to File, Place. And that's going to span the whole thing, fitting, fill frame proportionally. So it depends on what you're after, whether you want those, those spaces between them or you don't want the spaces in terms of how you're creating it. I think that about covers all of the stuff uh, that we need to cover today. We'll get into multi-page documents. We'll get into text across multi-page documents and that sort of thing going forward. Everything that I talked about today is available under the tutorial section in InDesign. So we started with. We have a line, image spanning frame, text as a frame. Oh, transparency. I didn't talk about transparency. Sometimes you want to adjust the transparency of an object. So for example, let's say that, uh, let me see here, what would be good? I'm just creating a shape here that goes across. And Right now it's a black bar. Let's make it gray so you can see it a little bit better. Okay, so I have that gray bar. Let's say I want that object to be transparent so I can see through it a little bit. If I switch from typography into the advanced section, we will get something called effects. Underneath effects, there's something called opacity, which I can then change to be, you know, say 50%, and it now becomes transparent. I can do the same thing with any of the other shapes. So I could take this shape and I can make that 50% transparent, for example, and that becomes transparent. So you've got that flexibility for transparency. There is a way to do a gradient transparency, but it's kind of a specialized thing. If you really want a gradient transparency, I'll help you do it. Um, so I wanted to at least introduce transparency should you want to do transparency. Notice also there's something called normal right here. Guess what? Blending modes. So it works the same as Photoshop. So we can use those blending modes in this as well. So you've already talked about blending modes. They might be relevant depending on what you're trying to do. So something like this, if we switch the blending mode to be, say, uh, screen mode, it's going to lighten up what's underneath it. it. might accent it a little bit more. Obviously, multiply is going to darken what's underneath it. So they just have different effects depending on what you're trying to do. And because we've talked about them before in Photoshop, I think it's important to, to point out that sometimes these are relevant. All right? Any questions? No, today's really about experimentation. I want you to play around with things. If you get stuck on something, you want to try something else, talk to me, and we'll try to get through that. All right?